Good morning. My name is AJ. I'm one of the pastors here at the church at Martinsburg, and it is a pleasure to welcome you again to another online worship service. This certainly is not ideal, as we would love and long to welcome you through one of our doors here at 50 Monroe Street, but the Lord's sovereign hand would have otherwise, and we know that he is good and that he still does good. If this is your first time interacting with us, as the church at Martinsburg. Man, we're so grateful that you've decided to, to tune in. We'd love to learn more about your story and see how we could serve you. Now, one of the best ways that you could just do that immediately is by downloading our app in the iOS or the Google Play Store. So that'd be a great way for you to just learn a little bit more about us. And also, as you feel compelled, you could jump in and let us know who you are as well. You can go there. You can watch or listen to all of our sermons and see the services that we've posted there. We also have a tile there on our app, which allows you to see COVID-19 updates. What we are doing as a church, trying to keep you abreast of situations uh, quickly and clearly. And uh, you are, we have uh, resources there for family worship and for discipleship opportunities, even links for a local engagement and what's going on here uh, with coronavirus. And so uh, jump in and, and be a part of that and utilize that app. You can also submit what we call a connect card, which is a great way for you to get us some information about yourself. We can learn how to be praying for you if you'd submit a, a prayer request. And uh, you can also give um, safely and securely of your, your tithes and offerings right there on the app as well. Additionally, I want to let you know that we are still hoping and working toward the end that we could have our Easter service right here just in a couple of weeks and want to put that before you so that you can begin or continue praying about that person or persons that you would be bringing with you. And so we're hoping that God will allow us to gather. But again, his sovereign hand is what's ruling our lives and we are most happy about that. And so before we uh, stand and sing or lay in bed and sing, I wanted to let you know about those kinds of things. And we look forward to the day where this lobby here is full of people and we can again gather here together. But until then, we hope that this service online is a blessing to you today. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son Who yielded his life and atonement for sin And opened the life gate that all may go in Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear his voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Rejoice, oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes That moment from Jesus a pardon receives Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice Father, Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great heart rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our 
transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he has done remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What Father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cost we stood beneath the debt we could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more into 
the arms of Christ, my Lord. Your grace that I cannot explain, not by my earthly wisdom. The Prince of Life without a stain was traded for this sinner. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I free walk into the arms of Christ my Lord let praise rise up and overflow my song resound forever for grace will see me welcomed home to walk beside my By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. By grace I am redeemed, by grace I am restored, and now I freely walk into the arms of Christ my Lord. Well, y'all know the expression, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. And if my research serves me right, then this expression, this idiom goes all the way back to the 1500s with a man named John Haywood. Sayings like these, they stand the test of time, regardless of what's going on around us, because they're true. And everything around us can change, and it seemingly is, but truth is truth. And truth remains when all else appears to be collapsing Around us. And as we turn the page over now to the last chapter in Nehemiah, chapter 13, we see this concept stretch well beyond the 1500s. In fact, chapter 3 of Nehemiah rests on the historical timeline right around 443 BC. Give them an inch, and uh, give them an inch rather, and they will take a mile. However, this is kind of lighthearted. Sometimes when we think about this, or at least when I think about it, we jokingly remember our kids who magically stretch five minutes into 30. Or maybe you think of your employees who take your generosity and the flexibility extended to them in their position, and they just run with it. You give them an inch, and they take a mile. We'll see these kinds of things begin to play out more and more in the foreseeable future as companies are just moving to virtual platforms for work, but I want, I want to warn you now. I just read an article this past week that is likely going to just ruin many of your plans. In fact, if your companies are utilizing uh, something like Zoom and you're in this meeting and you think that you're just getting away with scrolling Facebook, well, I've got news for you, Jack. Your boss can see it and knows when you are checking out. And so you're welcome for that. She can see your antics. And so prepare for that the right way. So yeah, this phrase, it can be a playful one at times, but the tone of Nehemiah 13 is not playful. It isn't playful. Rather, it would sound more like this. If you give sin an inch, it will take everything. And that's, what, that's what's at stake at uh, the 13th chapter of Nehemiah. And it's also what is at stake in all of our lives, regardless of where we find ourselves. And uh, our lives perfectly illustrate this. I mean, I wonder, how often, how often do we stop and find ourselves so frustrated that again, we are dealing with the same sin that we feel like we have been wrestling with for years. I mean, 10 years later, and you're still, you fill in the blank. With a wide audience like that we have right now online, the variety of answers will only increase. 10 years later, and you're still yelling at the kids. You're still smoking weed. You're still looking at porn, still hoarding resources, still hitting the bottle when times get tough still eating the bread of anxious toil. I mean, we feel like we we get our sin under control, but then we start to let our guard down a little bit, right? We begin to compromise. No, another episode of the Game of Thrones, that's not going to hurt anybody. And before you know it, you've given sin an inch, and it has taken everything. Before you know it, you feel like you're back to square one. 
The Bible actually speaks to these things, believe it or not. And I'm glad that you have tuned in today because we are going to hear from God who wants to speak to us through his word. And so if you're checking this out, looking for an updated message or some news on the coronavirus, then you've gone to the right place. Check out the news outlets. That, that is all they seem to be talking about these days, and, and fittingly so. But today we are going to hear from the word of God and how, how good and faithful he has been to his people for the generations all throughout history. And so here we are. In 2020, 10 years later, and you're still giving sin an inch, and it's still taking everything. Will we, will I ever overcome the sinful patterns in my life? And the ongoing presence in, in my own life often makes me wonder if there's any hope. Maybe you're, you're just like me. I mean, Christians listening and watching this even now will wonder if they're Christians just because of the lack of fruit that they see in their lives. I, I heard an old man, one who had been walking with the Lord for over 50 years, once say that he, he ever wondered if he'd be able to just kick old sinful patterns. And man, when I hear this, that's discouraging, right? I mean, a guy like this still saying those things? But fret not, beloved. The promise of Philippians 1, 6 is for you today just as it was for that old man, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And through the good and bad, though, I want to remind you, Christian, of what God expects of you. Don't compromise holiness. This is the big idea. The sermon in a sentence that we find in Nehemiah 13, 1 through 4 is this, that lovers of God don't compromise holiness. Lovers of God don't compromise holiness. But how? How, though? I mean, the grip of sin is so strong. Its enticement is greater than what our willpower seems to be able to control. Its sin's power, is, its temptation, its pull is, is stronger than our wills. And so, yes, on our own, we can't win that war. But the good news is that Jesus has won the war for us as he came and lived a perfect life that we have all failed to live. This is the basic understanding that God's standard for humanity is perfection. And we have all jacked that up. But out of love for us, God sent his only son, Jesus, to come and do what we failed to do, to live the life that we couldn't live ourselves. He came and he paid the penalty for sin by dying the brutal death on the cross that should have been mine. And our hope was then secured three days later when he rose from the grave. And he freely offers salvation now to all who would repent or change their mind about their sin, their life, and their ways and turn to him alone for salvation. This is the good news that God offers to every man, woman, and child today. This is the gospel. The word gospel literally means good news that brings joy. And if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus, you are by grace through faith his child. And I'm happy to tell you, if you didn't know, that God always meets the needs of his children. And those who have placed their faith in Jesus alone for salvation have been graciously given the gift of the Holy Spirit, who leads his people not into temptation, but he delivers them from evil. And because of the Holy Spirit, we can now fight sin in victory. And through the unfolding of Nehemiah 13, 1 through 14, We see how God has equipped Christians to fight the ongoing sin in our lives. In fact, as we look at this text, we're going to see three specific responses to sin that will prevent lovers of God from compromising holiness. Look, we aren't the only ones fretting over the sinful patterns in our lives. We pick up here and we see the same thing in Nehemiah chapter 13. We see an ancient version of modern life. Let me paint the the picture for us. Nehemiah, this man, had been sent into the city of Jerusalem to restore it after it had been ransacked a number of years prior. In 52 days, the city is secure. The people are now getting back to some sense of normalcy, which is a pretty nice thing. I mean, we all are probably longing for some normalcy right now. And as Nehemiah is undergoing this entire enterprise, he's had this thorn in his side through the whole thing. This thorn had a name, Tobiah the Ammonite. Now, Tobiah, would, he would regularly come and threaten and taunt Nehemiah and the fellow Jews out of fear. Tobiah, just like every other bully, is motivated by fear. Tobiah was, was afraid that should Nehemiah's undertaking be successful, he'd no longer be able to abuse the people of Jerusalem, to ransack their villages, and to plunder their goods. He was seeking his own pleasure over the good of the people, over the good of his neighbors. If I can encourage you with something this morning... 
is don't be like Tobiah. You see Tobiah through the first 12 chapters, he was all bark though, had no bite. I mean, I had a, a white boxer like, like this when I, was, when I was growing up as a kid, and fittingly enough, the dog's name was Voodoo. Like, don't, don't pass judgment. My brother named her. You can talk to him. Voodoo behind the fence looked like she would rip your arm off if you got close enough. But if you were brave enough to come into the yard, she was harmless. That is Tobiah. And if you're wondering how I came up with that, then you can see in chapter 6 the biteless bark of this man, Tobiah. However, most of the people, they never knew this about this man because they were too afraid to get close. His, his bark was ferocious, and it often drove them away in fear and, and in terror and panic. Well, in Nehemiah chapter 13, Tobiah finally sank his teeth in, and he would inflict a deep wound to the people of God. Nehemiah leaves town for work, and as he does, the people give sin an inch. Nehemiah, is good for you to know, is the acting governor of the city and region, and he has to report back to his uh, supervisor, King Artaxerxes, who's in Persia, some over 700 miles away. Evidently, their Wi-Fi connection wasn't all that good, so Zoom wasn't going to work out for them. So he's got to make the trek back to the king, and while Nehemiah is away, Tobiah gets to play. What happens is the people of God, they give sin an inch as they begin to initiate sinful relationships with surrounding peoples. And eventually, these peoples eventually take over the culture, which leads to a tarnishing of the glory of God through the defiling of the temple, the very place where God would meet with man. And now Nehemiah returns after his prolonged stint, and he sees the carnage of Tobiah's trickery and the people's adoption of old sinful patterns. See, we're not the only ones. Even ancient peoples of the Bible would fall back into old sinful patterns. We, we look at people in the scriptures and we tend to think that they have a little extra dose of holiness than, than we do, a little more grace than we do, but they're just like us, clay feet just like we have. And Nehemiah comes back in and he sees them returning to their old sinful patterns and this old boy goes bonkers, right? In fact, in chapter 13, we see two things as the whole text begins to unfold. The first is we see God's people completely undoing every promise that they made to God in covenant in chapter 10. The second thing we notice is Nehemiah comes and he brings reform again to restore their standing before God. And just by way of reminder, uh, the covenant of chapter 10 included three commitments that they were going to hold one another accountable to. The first is that they were going to avoid intermarrying with surrounding peoples. Secondly, they were to keep the Sabbath. And then thirdly, they had to support the temple ministry. That's, that essentially is Nehemiah 13 from a 15,000 foot view or so. And now what I'd like to do is for us to begin our descent on the book of Nehemiah as we look at the first 14 verses of chapter 13. So wherever you are, maybe you're uh, at home on the couch, you're in bed watching, uh, watching this sermon, wherever you might be, pull your Bible out. If it's on your phone, that's fine. Go to Nehemiah chapter 13, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 14, and it's here where we will discover the proper responses to sin that will prevent lovers of God from compromising holiness. Nehemiah 13, verse 1, says this, And on that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandments to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king. And then I came to Jerusalem and then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chambers, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? 
and I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padaiah of the Levites. And as their assistants, Hanan the son of Zachar, son of Medaniah, for they were, considerable, they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. And then Nehemiah prays. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Nehemiah was a lover of God before he was a lover of anyone or anything else. And lovers of God don't compromise holiness. And before we consider the responses, uh, that'll pre- uh, responses to sin that will prevent us from compromising holiness, it is most important that we recognize the standard To be holy, what does it mean? To be holy simply means to be set apart. And from the beginning of God saving people, his pattern is to call them from sin and then to set them on a new path according to his expectations. And as that happens, he sets them apart. He makes them holy. Christians today are holy, but not by our efforts, but through the shed blood of Jesus, which covers our sins. How did he do this? It's important to know what exactly happened at the cross. Not only on the cross did Jesus robe himself with the sins of those that would call upon his name, but while he took upon our sins, he also removed his own robes of righteousness and clothed us with it. All of those who would repent and believe would now be clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And because of that, because of that, there now is a way for sinners to be made holy. And now... God sets Christians apart the same way. He, does the, he sets Christians apart the same way today that he did with those ancient believers then, through his word. That's how we know what obedience looks like. We know his word. That's, why one, of the, that's the, one of the reasons why one of our core values here at the church at Martinsburg is the word matters here. God sets his people apart, and he makes his standards of living known through his word. It's clear as we look again at verses 1 through 3. See what I mean? Verse 1 says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. And as soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Listen to this. As soon as the people heard the law, what did they do? They obeyed. God set the standard, and they obeyed. But over time, they compromised. What happened? They gave sin an inch, and it took everything. There's no, no sitting on the fence type Christianity. There's no lukewarmness to Christianity. Either we are hotly pursuing a life of holiness or we're living in sin. That's a bold statement, maybe you'd say. Well, it's true. That's why repentance isn't just a one-time deal. As long as we have a pulse All of us, we are all going to be finding ourselves living in sin, and repentance is required again and again and again, daily even, multiple times a day. And and, and let me encourage you, beloved, if your prayers are just asking God for things, could I encourage you to, to change your model? In prayer, would you start with God? And considering his holiness, his beauty, Psalm 145, 5 says that he is greatly to be praised upon the glorious splendor of his majesty on his wondrous works, I will meditate. And then would you allow that to be the backdrop upon which you you see your own sinfulness, which leads you to repentance again and again and again, confessing your sin, affirming God's grace toward you and requesting additional grace to walk according to his ways. The point at which we are repenting, then we thank him for grace and mercy that we've been given in Jesus, and then would submit that well, our hearts are probably at a place where we could, in healthy ways, begin to bring things before him. That, that model is, is the ACTS model of prayer, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Verse 3, it says, as soon as the people heard the law, they repented, and they, obeyed, or they repented and obeyed. It, it didn't last long, though, right? I mean, we look more, and we see how it unfolds. 
the people of God, they break the covenant of God and dishonor the temple ministry. And when Nehemiah comes back to see the temple being abused, he demonstrates a severely righteous anger. This is just the beginning. It gets, it gets pretty interesting as we course through the book of, uh, or the chapter, 13th chapter over the next couple of weeks. And this man comes and sees the temple being defiled, and he, he flips his lid in a righteous way. Think for a moment. Does that sound familiar to you at all? I mean, I just love how the Bible is connected. I found uh, the words of one commentator to be, to be awfully striking, really. He says, Nehemiah stormed in as violently as one day his master would. He's referencing Jesus, of course, who cleansed the temple in Nehemiah-like fashion in Matthew chapter 1. But what did defiling look like in Nehemiah's time? Tobiah the Ammonite was given space to dwell in the, the temple the very place where God would meet with man. This was strictly forbidden in the law, and the Jews knew that. I mean, that was clear when we just read uh, 13 verse 1. So Nehemiah shows up, and he sees the vessels, the grain, and the other resources of the temple tossed in the dumpster so that this thug Tobiah could take up residence. These fools have cleaned out the prayer room and turned it into a crack house. Can you believe it? So cleansing commences. The Jews, who knows how long back, they gave sin an inch, and they're dealing with the consequences because it took everything. So Nehemiah, he comes in with one message. Don't compromise holiness. And if we'll take his responses to sin and apply them to our own lives, we too will fight against compromising holiness. The first response to sin is found in verses 8 and 9. Nehemiah says he came back and he says, I was very angry and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So the first response to sin is found in the text is this, remove the source of temptation. Remove it. Remove the source of temptation from your life. Look, what we see here is Nehemiah performing a, a holy fumigation. He wants no trace in the temple of this thug's stench. It's like an episode of Cops where the police get this domestic abuse call, and they roll up, and they find old boy's clothes had been spread all across the street because his woman had gone crazy and thrown his stuff out in the street. Like, this is Nehemiah. He's not messing around. He is a lover of God, and he will not compromise holiness, nor will he allow any that are under his leadership to do that either. I think about the Apostle Paul, who essentially instructs the church of Ephesus to do the same. Remove the source of temptation. Listen to his words in Ephesians chapter 4, 22 to 24. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through your deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. How seriously we take our holiness will determine the severity of our response. How seriously we take our holiness will determine the severity of our response. And this is often based on a level of comfort and convenience that we're just not willing to let go of. But if we're going to be honest, a pursuit of holiness isn't concerned about comfort. A pursuit of holiness is concerned about that's right, holiness. It's concerned about God's people through their lives accurately reflecting God himself. So to just get practical for a moment, if you can't stop looking at Facebook without internalizing gossip every 30 seconds, then deactivate your account. Remove the source of temptation. If you've got a drinking problem and you've got to to drink a little bit, to take the edge off after a long, hard day, then brother, sister, get rid of the liquor. Remove the source of temptation. If you cannot control your lustful tendencies on your phone, then get a flip phone. Remove the source of temptation. If you are an impulsive spender, then stop going to Target, right? I mean, remove the source of temptation. If you can't stop fretting over all of the potential COVID-19 scenarios, then stop watching the news, beloved. Remove the source of temptation. 
Now, look, I get it. This, of course, isn't the solution to correcting our long-term patterns of sin as the root of our problem is embedded deeply within our hearts, not our hands. But remember, whatever has our hearts will have our hands. And so to just remove the source of temptation from our lives is, is just behavior modification. So it can't be the only step, but it would be a healthy first step because it allows you to clear the path And to get an understanding of what moving forward could look like without these temptations in your life. But we can't just remove the source of temptation. We must replace it with something that will contribute toward our holiness. That's what Nehemiah did again in verse 9 when he cleared the stuff out from Tobiah's stuff. And and he brings back in the temple resources. That's what Paul instructs the Christians to do in the passage that we just read moments ago in Ephesians 4. Put off, but put something on in its place. Replace the temptation, not with another vice, but an instrument of godliness. You give yourself to prayer. Take this time that many of us have been afforded through social distancing or maybe even a a self-quarantine and devote yourself to, to studying the scriptures. Begin to understand the topic that you've always wondered about. What is the Trinity? Get a book about God and and devour it. Consider setting up FaceTime calls with people from your community group and investing in the community of God that he has given you. Look, a pursuit of holiness was never intended by God to solely be an individual pursuit. You see, not only does Nehemiah remove the source of temptation, his response continues, which reveals the necessity of Christian community. Look at verse 10. He says, I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Pursuing holiness is a church-wide effort. You see, we are destined to fail if we try to walk this path on our own. Because sometimes... We're just blind to what we're blind to. We need others to come along our paths and, and point out some things. But it's important how we, how we go about doing that. In verses 10 and 11, Nehemiah's second response to sin is found, which is to confront in love. Confront in love. And look, as their leader, Nehemiah had affection for these people. And like a good shepherd that he was, he wasn't willing to just sweep their wrongdoing under the rug, pretending as though it wasn't there. No, once he removes the source of temptation, he is quick to confront. But he's not like that angry supervisor that storms in seeking revenge, trying to make their lives just a little bit harder. No, 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 no. He demonstrates a great sense of self-control as he approaches them with the intent to confront in love. And we've got to know, just because Nehemiah approached in love, it doesn't mean that he came on eggshells. In fact, This word confronted in uh, verse 11 could also be translated as contend or grapple. This gives us the understanding that this was a very contentious conversation, but it was done out of love. And when God is in the middle of this kind of conversation, it's a beautiful thing. But we must be careful to approach it, understanding that the aim of our charge must be love. But today in our society, man, we are just... So easy to run away from any sort of confrontation that we we miss out on the blessing that happens when we confront in love. I mean, there are times when we are just dead wrong and we do need to be confronted. And when this happens, God does not expect fellow believers to just fall on their knees and to begin to offer long prayers of petition. Should we pray for one another? Of course. But in effect, God says, get up off your knees and go about the business of correcting the wrong. This is a means, a major means by which the Holy Spirit uses to sharpen us. Sometimes we need to confront in love with a loud, don't compromise holiness. One pastor once said, what the church needs is more people like the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 who, when confronted by Jesus about her sin, past and present, didn't chastise him or think him unloving for having done so, but instead she ran to everyone that she could to tell them what he had done. Confronting in love is a two-way road. The Proverbs say, faithful, faithful are the wounds of a friend. When we confront in love, we may produce wounds, but these wounds are more like those produced by a surgeon with a scalpel than those 
by a toddler with a razor. This means that when a fellow member of the church is in sin, you don't just sit back and wait for someone else to confront them. You do it. And when you confront, you confront in love. Galatians chapter 6 makes it clear that this type of confrontation is to be done with a spirit of gentleness, with the overall desire to being restoration. And a posture of humility is absolutely necessary on the part of the person doing the confronting. Because if not, then he or she grows boastful, forgetting the grace and mercy that they are needing on a daily basis by the Lord themselves. And I know... If you're hearing my words, you, as a member of the church in Martinsburg, I want to take a moment and just give you a reminder of, of your covenantal responsibilities to me and to every other member of this church. It means that we don't forsake gathering with one another on Sundays. Now, obviously, we are in unprecedented times. These are uncharted waters for many of us, and we pray for normalcy. And the point at which we return to normal gatherings on Sundays, and you see fellow members just kind of absent on a regular basis. It means that you, you confront in love. We hold one another to participate in the Lord's Supper. The last Sunday of every month, we come and we observe, we observe communion, where we see one another repenting of sin and, 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 and representing in this symbol what God has done for us at the cross. And when we see patterns on a regular basis of this brother or this sister withholding herself from communion then we should be concerned. And out of love, we, we should go to them and say, is everything okay? I've noticed you've not taken communion. What's going on? It, we are committed. We have a covenantal responsibility to pray for one another, to, to see to it that we are all giving sacrificially of our time, of our talent, and our treasure. So when you know a brother or a sister that isn't giving of these things in those ways, that you don't take the path of a coward and just... Pretend like you don't see it, but you confront in love the spirit of gentleness with the goal of restoration. We must confront in love, but despite our best efforts sometimes, they appear completely fruitless. If you've done this, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why we notice Nehemiah's last response being what it is. Nehemiah, the chief lover of God, was faithful to live according to the standard of God and his word. And when fellow believers stepped away from obedience, he was quick to respond, to remove the source of temptation and to confront in love. But he doesn't stop there because spiritual growth is, is an act of God, not an act of man. So look at verse 14, and, and we see his final response to sin where he, he does his best and then he just gives it to God. He prays, oh, Lord, remember me, oh, my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Don't just remove the source of temptation. Don't just confront in love. Verse 14 leaves us with what I would say is the most important response to sin. Devote yourself to God. Devote yourself to God. Nehemiah was quick to realize that without the Lord's blessing, his efforts would have been completely in vain. He had taken stock of all that he had accomplished over the last couple of years for God's name among the people of Jerusalem, and he realizes that if God was not the one watching over the city, then everything he had done would be completely useless. And similarly today, we must do the same. Christian, you must prayerfully devote yourself to God. Interestingly enough, though, Nehemiah doesn't look back over all that he's accomplished and begin requesting a memorial to be set up in the middle of the city. He's not coming to God seeking a plaque on the wall of the, the Hall of Fame in heaven. He's not concerned about his legacy among the Jerusalem Jews. Now, this man has an audience of one, just God himself. And because his primary desire was to please God, the responses we see demonstrated through this section, they're not crippling like they may be to us. Because with an accurate view of God, suddenly to the Tobias of this world, whether bark or bite, they aren't all that scary after all. Nehemiah remembered who God is, and he steps forward in obedience knowing that God's got this. You see, some of us here remove the source of temptation, and we think it's too radical. Surely that's not what he meant. Not to get rid of the computer. No, that's, that's a little too far. I mean, there's got to be a little, a little more of a, a logical approach to handling this sin, right? Don't just remove the source. I mean, that's too much. 
Or maybe we're cool with it, but others stumble over the call to confront others in love, and, and then we, we, hit the, we pump the brakes. That might be, that's a little too far, preacher. I don't have the right to be looking into other people's lives like that. Now, let me say this. If you're a member of any local church, then not only is this your right, it is your obligation to fellow members. And I would encourage you, as you've got some more time on your hands, you might still be working full time, but there ain't no sports right now anywhere in the world, so we're not watching those. So devote yourself at least in this time to consider this question. Do we ever see these kinds of responses elsewhere in the Bible? And I would submit to you with great confidence that if you would survey the scriptures, you'll notice that these two responses of removing the source of temptation, confronting others in love, these two responses are not radical. Rather, they are truly the normal responses of any followers of God who are pursuing holiness. And when, when we write the blank check of our lives and we lay them at the foot of God, we're freed up from the fear of man and the fear of outcomes because we know in no uncertain terms that we're safely in the arms of God. So would you devote yourself to him? Because lovers of God don't compromise holiness. And Christian, if you leave with one thought today, let it be that. Lovers of God don't compromise holiness. However chaotic the world gets in the coming days, don't compromise holiness. Whatever dangers or temptations come knocking at your door, don't compromise holiness. Whatever fears may come, whatever fears may start to grip your heart, can I, can I encourage you? Don't compromise holiness. The days are long. I get it. They're not just long, but they're hard. And they're also anxiety-ridden. The days are long. The years are fast. But we will look back on the era of COVID-19, and we will see we will see how God did incredible things through this unprecedented season, and we will marvel. So keep that in mind, and when you fail to go again to prayer, you should devote yourself to God. He is faithful. He is faithful, and as the fog thickens and you feel like you can't even see far enough ahead to take the next step, remember that God is already there. Fight the good fight of faith, Christian, for the glory of God and for the good of neighbor. And let me urge you through whatever may come, feast or famine, don't compromise holiness. God, thank you for your word. Pray that you would guard us as your people. Help us to love you so much that we would appear as though we hate everything else that our commitment to you, our resolve to pursue holiness would be far greater than anything else. Lord, as we are in such tumultuous times, our faith is tested. Oh, Lord, may we be like the early church in the, the seasons of plagues where we would see this as a test of our faith and we would run wholeheartedly toward difficulty, knowing, Lord, that uh, this will produce character, that will produce hope, that will not leave us to be put to shame. And so we entrust ourselves to you. Lord, I pray for those folks watching, listening from their homes with unsettled hearts that don't know you. Oh, Lord, would you lead them to repentance and faith in Jesus? We pray that you would have your way in our world. We pray that it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We know that it will be. You sit on the throne of the universe. You're doing all that you please. So I pray today that it will please you to use us for your glory and for the joy of our neighbor. Have your way among us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian, before you close that browser, let me remind you, be the church. Look around and see what opportunities to serve others are around you. Even this week, I heard about a one gal who's a teacher and offered up one line to help parents who were really unsure how to walk through curriculum with their kids. What a great way to just use experience and skill set and, and desires to serve people around them. I heard from another lady this morning who told me uh, that she was just dropping packages off on people the stoop in their neighborhood as, uh, as they uh, made needs known. And so in light of that, 
Think about your own life. What people do you know? What needs do you see? How can you be the church through this tumultuous season? So go church in Martinsburg. Love your neighbor for the glory of God. You are sent.